Okay, so uh, we had worked on uh, deriving equations for the structure behind a detonation. Um, and we're basically, we're trying to, do, to uh, compute or derive equations that can be used to compute the structure uh, behind a detonation. And so our starting point for the differential equations that we're gonna be deriving are just behind the shock where we just have shock reactants. And then we're just gonna be, oh, go away. Uh, then we'll have, <clears throat> then we'll be, uh, then we'll be describing how the chemical, uh, how the chemical uh, reactions are ignited uh, and how those affect the flow. Okay, and so we we're just we're just going through standard 1D planar steady conservation of mass and species mass, and we're working with and we were working with the energy. And what we were doing was we are working towards basically trying to cast the equations in terms of pressure and density. And so <clears throat> what we need to do then is we basically wrote that the enthalpy is a function of pressure and density, which are the two variables that we want. I mean, and normally it's more naturally to use uh, more natural to use temperature for uh, temperature for instead of density for uh, uh, as your second variable for the enthalpy. Uh, but for this stuff, it's usually more traditional to use density, and that's partly because for explosives, uh, we do uh, for those kinds of materials at those kinds of pressures, you don't really have a a reliable um, a thermal equation of state. That is, if the Z and D spike for a high explosive, which is at about 50, 60, uh, 50, 60, giga, uh, uh, 50, 60 gigapascals, uh, no one really knows what the temperature is. Uh, you can't use molecular dynamics because at, at those kinds of conditions, all the potentials that are needed to, to compute how the different molecules interact with each other are, are themselves not even accurate. So, we, so uh, unless you're dealing with ideal gases, uh, you tend to write uh, the enthalpy as a function of pressure, which you know fairly well, and density, which you also know fairly well. Okay, and so we were working towards that, uh, derived this big mess of an equation here, and through some Maxwell's equations, mag uh, magic with the Maxwell's uh, 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 relations, uh, this just turns into the speed of sound squared. And then we basically wound up with this really goofy parameter here, and that was called the that was called the uh, thermicity, and the thermicity really it describes uh, the coupling between the uh, uh, between the flow uh, behind the shock wave uh, <clears throat> and the chemical reaction. And again, on this derivative here, uh, you can do some Maxwell's uh, re uh, relation type stuff uh, or, or thermodynamic relations. And you can break this up into, into two different pieces. I'm not going to do that. Uh, but you can break it up into this term here. That's a fractional change in density with respect to changing mass fraction. And so this here is describing the acceleration or deceleration of the flow just due to the fact that the chemical reaction is changing the, is changing the chemical composition. That is, if you have a very heavy fuel molecule, like, say, endodecane, uh, and you go to combustion products, which are CO2, you are changing, uh, you are changing basically one, uh, you are changing a very heavy fuel molecules into very small uh, combustion products. And so there's a change of density, or there's this term here that is associated with that. And then also, there's this also the sort of uh, traditional thermal heating term here. And so remember that the, um, uh, that uh, that the that the bulk expansion coefficient is just a fractional change of density due to temperature due to a change in temperature, and the change of enthalpy over CP is a fractional change of is a fractional change of temperature due to a change in chemical species mass. And so this here is the chemical heating term here. Okay. So are there any questions with that? Okay. Um, pro professor. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, what's like a good way to physically think about thermicity? Uh, basically, kind of how I described it here um, is it just really describes the coupling between the the uh, the sort of fluid mechanics and 
and uh, endic combustion. I guess one way you could think about it is that say you have a constant area duct and you have some hydrogen and air in there and there's an igniter. So basically the inlet to the duct is just pure hydrogen air and the exit of the duct is uh, uh, our high temperature of uh, combustion products. Well, somehow, even though the total energy is constant in that duct, somehow basically something caused uh, those combustion products to accelerate because intuitively the combustion products would accelerate, not. Uh, correct. So basically then, then basically what's causing them to accelerate? It's this thermicity term right here. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, and so, and then when I write the equations in, in, in terms of pressure, velocity, and density, these, uh, uh, how this thermicity affects the flow will become much more, it will become much more evident. Okay. okay. But also uh, these equations that I have derived, um, uh, they, made, they made no assumption. There does not have to be a shock wave there. Uh, so this also works for a constant area duct. So you could have a constant area duct where you're in, where you are injecting fuel in, uh, and these equations still work. Okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> so now, if we take the thermicity here and then plot it, uh, so here's just a structure of a detonation. Here we have x equals zero. The shocks right here. The uh, reactants are right here. The shock reactants are here, and the final equilibrium combustion products are here. And so the temperature will start at some, uh, behind the shock, will start at some intermediate temperature. This is just due to shock compression. Then eventually the chemical reactions will kick in and the temperature will, will basically start to increase and rise uh, to, their final, uh, uh, to, their final, to their final equilibrium temperature. Okay, now if you plot the thermicity, which is related to the rate of chemical reaction, the, Thermicity curve will look something like this. It'll essentially be zero in the reactant state. Uh, this would be very much on a log scale. And then it'll sharply go up somewhere in the middle of this heating zone here. Then it'll peak. Then as the reactants start to become depleted, uh, the, rate of chemical, uh, the rate of chemical reaction will start to go down again. And then it'll go down and decay to zero uh, as we approach chemical equilibrium. And so the thermicity peak has this very sort of, uh, the thermicity curve has this very peaky like structure. And the, and sometimes for detonations, you need to have, uh, you are interested to know uh, how wide is the reaction zone and what the reaction zone in is, is uh, what the reaction zone is, is this distance uh, be, uh, basically from the shock wave to the to the to the to the equilibrium point. So basically, the thickness of the of the detonation uh, itself is we are often very interested in that, um, so that we can start to scale things and know how big if we want to make a tube, how big to make the tube, things like that. And so a common scaling that is used to describe how thick uh, the sort of reaction zone behind the shock wave is of a detonation is to use the so-called induction length. And the induction length is just defined as the uh, the uh, the spatial location uh, behind the shock wave, where there where you have a peak value of the thermicity, and that's all that is. Uh, there is another common one, and that's called the half reaction thickness. And so for that one, that one's a, that one's a bit easier to a uh, bit easier to understand, but it it only makes sense if you have two species reactants going to products. Okay, so you just have some global, uh, some global reactants. And what that is defined as, so I have the shock here, shocks right here. So you have a mass fraction of one for the reactants. And then they eventually, they, they start to burn and, and they start to decay. And the half reaction thickness is the spatial location behind the shock where, where the mass fraction of the reactants is is 0 0.5, and that's called the half reaction thickness. Okay, and so you see both, uh, you see the half reaction thickness used um, in a lot of the theoretical literature, uh, which assumes ideal gas 
uh, Argos to peak type of chemical kinetics. Um, and if you're dealing with detailed chemical kinetics and things like that, uh, they tend to use the induction length. Because if you're dealing with a mixture of different reactants, say, you know, five or 10 of them, uh, and you have dissociation and all kinds of stuff going on at chemical equilibrium state, it's very difficult to basically uh, de define one half of the reactants, especially because some of them may be left over uh, in the product. So, uh, so this tends to be used for theoretical uh, calculations, whereas this tends to be used for more real uh, type applications. Uh, and these do not give the same numbers. They scale the same way, but, but they do not give the exact same quantitative values. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, so now with the uh, now with the thermicity and its sort of parameters, uh, thought about our conservation of energy, uh, which we had uh, this giant thermicity term here. We just define that as sigma dot. Now we've turned this big long uh, this big long uh, energy equation full of nasty partial thermodynamic derivatives. And we've turned it into this fairly simple looking uh, equation here. Okay, so recall that for mass, we had this equation here. For species mass, we had this equation here. For momentum, we derive this equation here. And now we have energy. And so now what we do is we take these equations here, because right now we have a dp dx and a d rho dx here. We have a d rho dx and a du dx here, and we have a du dx and a dp dx here. Well, these are all sort of mixed equations and they're all really crazily interdependent on each other. And this is certainly the kind of thing that we cannot stick into uh, uh, ODE 45 in MATLAB right now, uh, uh, or uh, our solve IVP uh, in, uh, in Python. So instead, what we do is we take these equations here and we solve for d rho dx, du dx, and dp dx to get differential equations for each of those sort of values or for these spatial derivatives by themselves. And if you do that, you get uh, d rho dx is equal, to my, is equal to minus rho over u times the thermicity over this eta term here. And eta is just defined to be the the uh, uh, the sound speed squared minus the flow velocity squared. Uh, dyi uh, dx that was already by itself, so that didn't change at all. Uh, du dx is equal to minus of uh, to the negative of the thermicity divided by eta, <clears throat> and the p dx is equal to minus uh, minus u rho times times this thermicity over eta. And so if you look at u here, you can see how the thermicity plays into accelerating the flow uh, directly. Okay, so, <clears throat> and so if you have an inert flow, a sigma dot is zero, that means there is no acceleration, which basically makes sense because then our Z and D structure would just be a flat normal shock wave. So basically the, sh the shock interacts with the flow and there is nothing happening behind that shock wave, so there's no acceleration. Where if you have where you if you have chemical burning and negative thermicity, that's you know that's like chemical energy release. Then you accelerate the flow uh, uh, be, uh, behind the shock wave. Okay, and so it's sort of so now these equations here show you how the thermicity uh, couples with the uh, how it directly couples uh, uh, with the fluid mechanics. And the most intuitive one uh, to understand is uh, the acceleration of the flow velocity. Okay, so I hope that helps. I hope looking at this sort of helps answer the, the question that I got earlier. And I will make a note is that sometimes times eta will be defined as one minus the Mach number squared, and sigma dot will be defined as what I call sigma dot. Uh, but they don't have the speed of sound squared in it. So just, so just be careful of that, is that they will define thermicity uh, without the speed of sound squared term here. Okay, so just be careful is that there are, there are multiple definitions. Uh, this term here will be the same. Uh, this term here 
uh, the speed of sound squared term may or may not be there. Uh, if the speed of sound squared term is not there, then the eta will be basically one minus the Mach number squared. Okay, so just be, be uh, aware of that. So thermicity, Oh, the C squared. Okay. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, this version tends to be used by gas dynamicists and, and the gas phase de uh, the gas phase detonation people. Uh, and this version tends to be used by the explosives people. Okay, because I guess I suppose if you work in gas dynamics, you're you are trained to think in terms of one minus the Mach number squared. Okay, so now let's look at now let's look at the influence of the thermicity on our flow. So recall that if c squared uh, minus u squared is greater than zero, uh, we have subsonic flow behind the shock wave. If c squared minus u squared is less than zero, we have not supersonic, supersonic. I guess hooked on phonics worked for me. Um, we have supersonic flow be, uh, behind the shock wave. And if sigma dot is greater than zero, we have uh, exothermic chemical reactions. And if sigma dot is less than zero, it is endothermic. <clears throat> okay, so if, and so we can look at the influence of thermicity on the various variables. And we can see that if, the, if, we, are, if we have exothermic reactions and the flow is subsonic, uh, we increase the flow velocity. Actually, I think I can use it backwards. Okay, and then we <clears throat> and then uh, we accelerate the flow. Uh, if the flow is supersonic, we decelerate it uh, because we change the sign of eta. And and then you can basically go through the, you can basically go through this exercise. And so what you see here is that. Um, if we have an exothermic chemical reaction, if it's subsonic, we will accelerate the flow uh, behind the shock wave. If it's supersonic, we will, we will basically de we will basically decelerate the flow behind the shock wave. So, in other words, if we have only exothermic chemical reactions, uh, the flow accelerating to the speed of sound behind the shock wave is a very natural, e uh, stable equilibrium point. Um, and so that's sort of what you expect to happen is that it becomes a stable equilibrium point uh, just from even this sort of standpoint alone. Now, this also tells you how, if you want to create the conditions to make a weak detonation, and recall that a weak detonation looked, was over here, that if you wanted to make a weak detonation that basically, you needed to have supersonic flow uh, behind the shock wave, and this tells you exactly how to do that. And it's pretty and it's pretty wild how you how you would actually have to do this, because one you need to recognize that behind the shock wave, the flow U is always super, is always subsonic. Uh, behind the shock wave or behind a stationary shock wave. Uh, the flow is always subsonic. So if you want to have supersonic flow behind the shock wave, you first need to accelerate the flow to, uh, you first need to accelerate the flow to the sonic point. And you do that by basically adding chemical energy or, or having positive or yeah, positive thermicity. Then uh, if you keep adding energy to it, it's going to stay at the sonic point. Is that it, it's it's not going to do anything. But if you want to keep accelerating the flow at the sonic point where eta is zero, and the flow between uh, and basically this eta term here switches sign, the chem uh, uh, the chemical the the chemical reactions also need to make a switch from exothermic to endothermic at the exact sonic point. And if you do that. Uh, then you start to increase. Um, then you start to increase. Then you start to accelerate the flow, and that's basically what this says uh, right here. Is that basically 
is 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 that basically to to produce a weak uh, a, a a weak detonation, both of these uh, uh, both because at the sonic point, eta is going to change sign, and if you want to keep acceler accelerating the flow uh, uh, to a supersonic state, then at the precise location that eta changes sign, sigma dot also has to change sign, and so the only way to do that is to find this magical material. Uh, that magically switches from exothermic to endothermic at the sonic plane, and that I think there have been some experiments of a very, very carefully uh, designed uh, set of reactants that do that, and these have been observed. Uh, but it's a sort of a laboratory scale thing, uh, mainly for fundamental understanding. Uh, these are never um, uh, these you almost never observe these in practice. I say almost never, and it's probably never, uh, but I'm sure some old, you know, uh, graybeard experimentalist could sort of come up to me and say, "We've uh, we've have observed these in our, you know, in some crazy uh, condition 50 years ago," but uh, but that's basically what it takes to make a weak detonation. So that's why, for all practical purposes, the weak detonation branch uh, is uh, over here. That is not practical. And also, I uh, I had uh, a range of arguments as to why a CJ detonation, which is right here, and and the and the velocity of the products is sonic with respect to the shock wave, why that makes sense from in terms of just a wave interacting with the uh, in terms of a wave interacting with the reactant zone of a detonation. This here, uh, this this sort of natural tendency of a chemical reaction to be exothermic uh, all the way to the end. Um, uh, um, um, and and then basically, if the flow is, or if the reactions are, are only exothermic, then you should expect that the stable that the stable equilibrium point uh, would be, uh, uh, be basically would be the sound speed. Okay, uh, provided there's enough uh, that 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 the total amount of energy that you are adding to the flow is enough to accelerate it to the sonic point in the first place, and that's what happens with a strong. With a with a strong uh, uh, detonation, is that the stronger a shock, the for a stationary shock wave, the uh, the uh, the sort of stronger you, uh, the stronger the flow is behind it. Are the stronger the flow is behind our the stronger a shock wave is. Uh, the stronger a, the stronger a shock wave is, uh, the uh, the slower and slower and slower the gases are be uh, 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 behind that shock wave, and so if you are adding uh, so if you sh so if you have a very strong shock wave, and the gas is starting out at a much lower velocity, it's going to take more energy to accelerate that gas to the sonic condition. Now the issue is is that uh, for a CJ detonation, you have just the perfect amount of energy to accelerate the uh, the to accelerate the products to the sonic condition. So if you have an overdriven de uh, detonation up here or a strong uh, detonation, there simply is not enough chemical energy in the flow to accelerate it to uh, to accelerate it to the sonic uh, condition. So. Essentially, what happens then is sigma dot goes to zero because there are no more reactants uh, well before eta goes to zero. And so basically, there's just not enough energy in the flow uh, to accelerate it to the sonic condition. Okay, and so even from these equations here in Rankine Hugonia, we can really learn a lot about detonations. And if you want to learn more about the structure, and I'll give you uh, a homework problem where you start to use where you start to use Cantera. Uh, and there's a, a, a plugin for that called the shock and detonation toolbox. Uh, and you can actually integrate, uh, solve these equations here. You don't have to solve them, they solve them for you. Uh, for, um, for an ideal gas uh, with an arbitrary uh, a number of, with an arbitrary number of chemical reactions, uh, like you can use um, a real industrial strength, a reaction mechanism for endodecane with say 3000 chemical reactions. And you can actually examine the the extreme details of the structure behind the the the, uh, the detonation for an ideal gas. Um, okay, so I mentioned this. 
So um, are there any questions with this then? Okay, so the procedure to find the structure of a planar detonation is one, you find DCJ and you can find DCJ uh, just based on the tangency condition uh, of the Hugonio. Basically, that the, that that for the CJ detonation, uh, uh, the Rayleigh line and the shock Hugonio uh, are tangent at the CJ point, and so you can apply that condition. And for an ideal gas with constant properties, uh, you can derive an explicit relationship for uh, DCJ, and I showed you that one earlier. Then, um, then what you do is you commonly choose F. F is an overdrive factor. Uh, it's greater than or equal to zero. And so F would be uh, just the sort of ratio of the detonation velocity that you actually want to study uh, and uh, uh, divided by the CJ uh, velocity squared. I have no idea why the theoreticians uh, decided to square this, but they did. And so uh, if F is equal to zero, you are studying the structure behind uh, um, a, uh, 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 a CJ detonation. If F is greater than zero, uh, you are studying the structure behind a strong uh, detonation. And remember, because you don't have that tangency condition of the Rayleigh line in, uh, uh, in the product Hugonio, is that there is no sort of stable uh, eigenvalue or propagation velocity for uh, uh, a strong uh, detonation. Is basically you have to pick it uh, and say, I want the strong detonation to be the strong and just study the structure uh uh behind that strong detonation okay but just note that the strong detonation as i argued earlier uh it is not stable it will eventually decay to a chapman uh detonation unless you keep forcing it with a uh, uh with a piston okay which again almost never happens okay and so then step two is our e equations are valid behind the shock wave so you apply the frozen shock relations uh, to find the uh, to find the, the shock velocity uh, using dn uh, to find the uh, to find the pressure density temperature uh, velocity etc in the zmd spike. So if we plot the structure here, we are now right here. Uh, we are now on the other side of the shock, and basically these equations here. Are nothing more than even though there are there are spatial derivatives, these are, are nothing more than a system of ordinary differential uh, equations. Okay, and so basically you can just solve them starting from the shock and basically working towards the uh, and then integrate towards uh, the sonic plane. Okay, so now we are here. You can use uh, uh, the shock relations uh, if you're using an ideal gas with constant properties. Uh, you can use the you can use the expressions from any gas dynamics or compressible flow book uh, uh, to basically uh, to basically find what those are. Uh, if you're dealing with a uh, ideal gas with sort of real specific heats uh, or a real gas equation of state such as BKW, uh, then you need to probably do the shock relations numerically. Um, and then also note that the chemical composition uh, 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 in the ZND spike are the are, are really the initial conditions for your uh, 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 for the differential equations is the same chemical composition as the reactants, and so these are the initial conditions. Okay, and then you integrate. Uh, the ODEs uh, to find the structure. Okay, and then you see, then you stop integrating uh, if eta is equal to zero. And normally, your ODE solver will complain if you let it go to eta equal to zero, because uh, because the equations become singular there, and so they don't they do not like that singularity. And so, uh, in your project one instructions, uh, you can use what's called an event finder, and then before the be before the ODE solver takes its internal step, it will look for that event, and then it will basically not hit that. Uh, it's not used in fluid mechanics uh, very much. This is one of the only applications where, where, where we basically need that, but it's used a lot in mechanics. Uh, for example, 
say you have uh, a ball and you have a, gra a, uh, a, uh, a gravitational field and you're just going to drop the ball. And then there's some sort of coefficient of restitution uh, from the impact of the ball. So as a function of time, uh, the height of the ball would look something like this. Well, the ODE solver will blow up if you just uh, uh, if you just let it go to the point where the ball hits the ground. So what you have to do is you have to find an event, and the event is the ball hits the ground. Then after the ball hits the ground, you need to you basically need to reset the velocity of the ball to uh, from a from a downwards uh, velocity to an upwards velocity, uh, and then basically restart the ODE solver. And so, uh, and so there's, and so those event finders are used a lot in mechanics to uh, avoid uh, like integrating these uh, basically past these points here. Because if you were to give uh, the ODE solver an infinite force to suddenly apply to the ball, it will blow up. And so, um, so mechanics is another reason or is another area that you see these event finders uh, used uh, a lot. Okay. And so that's what I mean by stop integrating if eta is equal to zero. Uh, uh, or you have chemical equilibrium, which means sigma dot is equal to zero. Okay. Hey, Professor. Yeah. I have a question with the equations for the ODEs. For the mm -hmm. one with the, the pressure one, where does that eight come from? Oh, that's not an eight. That's a really bad row. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, my handwriting is uh, is not the best, and then you then you factor writing in writing on an iPad is kind of weird too. So it's bad writing uh, uh, with uh, 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 that that is uh, that is exacerbated by 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 the iPad screen. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, and so then you stop integrating uh, if eta is equal to zero, then. Uh, if you have a CJ detonation, uh, you'll find or you set F is equal to zero. On, unless you made a mistake, you'll find that sigma dot and eta will be zero at the same point, or numerically very close to the same point, uh, within you know a factor of ten to the minus six. Uh, if F is greater than zero, you have no sonic plane, and I already explained uh, why. So basically, uh, basically sigma will become zero, uh, but eta won't be zero yet. Okay, so are there any questions with this? Okay, so now we've discussed planar detonations, a 1D. So now we need to discuss the effect of curvature on detonations. Uh, and this gets into something called detonation shock dynamics or DSD theory. And so, uh, so you have this really nice uh, chapman jagay and ZND model for a planar uh, detonation, but in practice, at least for high explosives, uh, if you have a so-called rate stick, which you could think of as a stick of dynamite, and you can vary the diameter of your stick of dynamite, and you ignite a detonation, and you measure how fast uh, the detonation goes. Uh, so we have our stick of high explosive here, which I've drawn in green. Uh, you have the detonation wave propagating into the stick of explosive, and you have basically products. Uh, uh, you have you have products from that detonation, uh, all kinds of air shocks, uh, things like that. And what they find though is that the velocity of the detonation wave is not quite C, is uh, does not quite reach the CJ detonation velocity. What they find is that the smaller the diameter is of the sort of so-called rate stick. Uh, the slower the measured detonation velocity. And so what they noted is that the detonation velocity, which I'm just going to call D, uh, is some function of the diameter of the stick. And they noticed that if this diameter is, is basically too small, uh, the detonation will start in the beginning from the, from the igniter because it's initially uh, overdriven substantially, but eventually uh, the detonation will basically die. Uh, it basically won't live. Uh, you will have a big chunk of explosive that is completely unburned uh, if the diameter of your stick is too small. And so uh, this has been borne out of experiments here. 
And so here we just have, uh, this here is uh, a plot of, of the detonation velocity. Uh, note that a millimeter per, uh, a millimeter per microsecond uh, is the same thing as a kilometer per second. And so, yeah, so explosives have very, very fast detonation velocities. Uh, and we have here on the x-axis, uh, basically one over uh, the uh, 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 one over the radius of the tube. So this is a sort of curvature term, which basically we will uh, discuss later. And so you can see in the beginning, here we have a nice linear uh, relationship that essentially uh, the smaller and smaller we make the diameter of the uh, uh, of the uh, 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 of the uh, uh, of our stick, uh, the slower and slower the detonation goes until eventually it makes a turn here. And then beyond this point, they simply can't measure the velocity of a detonation uh, anymore. So it basically fails to live uh, if, uh, if the radius is too small. Okay, and they all exhibit these sort of types of behaviors. Okay, and so now, so this has been born in experiments. So we need to sort of think about this is why, I mean, you know, I just said for the planar uh, CJ detonation that they're very robust. That is, there's really nothing that can really influence them because again, you have the sonic plane where basically eta is equal to zero uh, behind it. There are no uh, there are no downstream effects that can influence that detonation. Um, and upstream, it's a shock wave, and you know, it's just a stick of dynamite. And the stick of dynamite is the same whether it's a big diameter or a small diameter. So, you know, we're not affecting the upstream state uh, and the downstream state should not be affecting the detonation. So why is, is there this weird uh, diameter effect on the detonation, on, on the measured detonation velocity? Well, the answer is uh, shock curvature. So if you look at, this was uh, provided by Scott Stewart. Uh, if we look at the simulation here that he did, of uh, we have a high explosive, it's called PBX 9502. I think that one's mainly RDX, I can't remember. Um, and we have uh, basically plexiglass. So we have a high explosive charge over here that is bounded by, uh, by a soft material uh, up, uh, called a, a PMMA or plexiglass. Uh, you may not think of it as, as, as being very soft in your, in your everyday life, uh, but trust me, if you have a, uh, this is pressure here. If you have a, if you have 40 gig, if you have 40 GPA of pressure uh, pushing on uh, on plexiglass, it, it's going to be soft. So what happens is the detonation is basically propagating down, and it's transmitting a shock wave into uh, uh, into the plexiglass uh, and solids. Uh, for those of you who don't work in this area, solids do transmit shock waves. Uh, you can solve ranking Hugonio jumps for them just like you do. Uh, uh, for gases, the equation of state or the equivalent of the equation of state is really funky, uh, as Braden will be able to tell you. Um, uh, but it's still just a normal shock wave. It follows the same normal, uh, it follows the same sort of uh, patterns and, and behaviors that a gas dynamic shock wave does. And so, then also due to the uh, due due to the very strong pressure behind the detonation here, uh, the base uh, the basic uh, basically the interface between the uh, between the plexiglass here and the explosive here is actually being is actually being pushed outwards. Okay, so the de so the detonation products live in sort of this region right here, and this and basically this region here would be the reaction zone. First of all, you can see that there's a strong multidimensional influence here. And it does not, if, if there is no multidimensional influence, uh, your shock would look something like this. So here's a PMA, let me draw that purple. Is that if there was no influence here, is you'd have the detonation here and the end of the reaction zone would be here and they would be perfectly flat, okay? And so they would just basically propagate up uh, but that's but that that's not what's going on here, and so what's going on here is that as a consequence of uh, of of our casing or our confiner being soft, 
and transmitting this very strong uh, oblique shock into the PMMA is that it's turning the flow and then and which is also turning uh, which is also uh, basically pushing out this interface but as a consequence of that is that if we transmit a shock here uh, to connect the states behind the detonation to the shock uh, internally inside of the uh, detonation there are expansion waves that are that are propagating from the side here down into the down into the reaction zone so what happens if we have an expansion wave well our shock just went along and shock heated the reactants to the point to where they can ignite now we have this jerk of an expansion wave that is coming along through the side and it's cooling everything back down so if you cool everything back down uh like close to the wall that's going to slow down the chemical reaction and so that's and so that locally slows down the uh, that so that locally slows down the detonation uh near uh basically near uh basically near this wall here and so that's part of why this portion of the detonation right here is lagging behind the portion of the of the of the detonation here is that there's a very strong expansion wave here and it's essentially killing uh all of the chemical reaction is that there's there's very little uh, there's not much reaction going on here okay and so and so it's this uh it's this uh, and so and so basically what's going on here is this expansion wave is actually adding curvature to the shock is that our shock wave is not perfectly planar anymore or our detonation wave is not planar it now has curvature and it's that and it's and it's that detonation curvature was which, which is what the z and d model uh and cj theory are are and ranking hugonio theory fail to take into account and so now we need to account for that okay and so what detonation shock dynamics does or dsd is it accounts for the uh detonation structure for uh, uh, uh for these weakly curved uh detonation shocks and recall that planar chapman jagay detonations are stable uh due to this uh uh, uh basically due to uh basically due uh uh, due to uh, due to the sonic plane because the sonic plane isolates uh the reaction zone that is we have our shock here we have our sonic plane here and the flow here is sonic with respect to the shock so that means any acoustic wave that is made behind the detonation front cannot make it into the reaction zone okay and then the and then basically uh the sonic point here and the shock then basically move downstream as an isolated unit. Uh, but what if something were to occur while, uh, but basically, uh, but basically, if you're considering a multi-dimensional uh, detonation, basically, what if something uh, like this expansion wave was to was to basically sneak into the side? So here, I'm just gonna sort of, uh, sort of sketch it out, is that we have ideally our detonation uh, going into the explosive we have a reaction zone right here and we have our sonic plane right here and we have some sort of confiner or a casing material well so again we have our detonation moving down uh, i did a blow up uh, right to here we have our our chemical reaction zone and in this reaction zone uh the pressure again is on the order of 40 50 gigapascals which is much 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 larger than than the yield stress of about every single uh material that i know of and so what's going to happen is this high pressure in here as i said earlier it's going to push out this confining it's going to push out this confining material if you push out that confining material like you have here you're going to produce expansion waves those expansion waves are going to cool and reduce the pressure of the reactants in this region right here. Okay. And another way that you can think about it is that the fact that the confiner is soft, it sort of adds side relief uh, to the pressure for the detonation is that is that the sort of pressure can sort of bleed out the side. Okay. Um, then it, yep, the, the pressure and temperature decrease, the D decreases locally. And it slows down the uh, chemical, the sort of chemical reactions right here. Or in, in some cases, uh, the the expansion is maybe so strong 
that they even quench and just stop all they just and just stop uh, altogether. And so as a result, uh, the detonation here, which basically was planar, it will it will it will become curved because the chemical reactions are slower here than they are over here. Okay. And then and then eventually, if the detonation lives, uh, you'll have an equilibrium uh, structure where where the detonation is curved. And why this curvature is important is that if you look from the point of view of the of the detonation, there is there is flow coming into it, uh, even though the flow is uh, is uh, the the streamlines are straight in front of it uh, to the best of my ability to draw them, but due to the curvature of uh, of the leading shock, they basically get turned into an expansion fan, and it's this expansion fan, which is uh, which is which is basically adding. Uh, an expansion component inside of the reaction zone uh, is actually having the substantial influence. So the reason that the uh, um, uh, that uh, that these that these detonations uh, uh, are that these ray sticks have this strong diameter dependence is due to this effect right here. And if you were to decrease the diameter of this charge, this expansion wave here may consume all of the material. So basically this strong expansion region here, where it's so strong, you may, you may even quench all of the reactions instead of just being a small teeny tiny portion of the explosive. If we make the explosive say this tall, it, it may kill all of the, it may kill, it, it, it may kill the reaction in all of the explosive material, uh, basically rather than just a small portion of it. And so that introduces, uh, so, that's a basically hand wavy argument for the uh, um, uh, for the uh, for the watchman call it uh, a hand wavy argument uh, for the detonate for the effect of detonation curvature. Okay, and another way, uh, and so basically uh, we can have stuff uh, stuff sneaking into the side, uh, which can curve the uh, detonation. And another way to induce curvature is through a process called detonation uh, di uh, diffraction. So say we have a uh, perfectly rigid uh, confinement, which of course does not exist uh, at these conditions. I think my Apple pen. Apple pen's dead. Let's see. So uh, you have a rigid confiner here. Uh, and basically we have, I don't really need it now. Uh, we have a, a CJ detonation at, at time T naught. And that's going to encounter this sudden increase in flow area here, and that detonation is not going to just um, is not just going to keep going straight, but it's going to turn down, it's going to turn down like this, and and, be, and then basically start to consume uh, the material. Well, this portion between the detonation moving down and the detonation moving to the right, that also introduces curvature. And if and then uh, if this diameter here is is extremely small, uh, the uh, 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 the curvature between the downward moving portion and the forward moving portion may be extremely high, and you wind up with a region uh, of unburned high explosive charge, and then and then these are called and, and and these are called dead zones. Okay, and so here basically rather than a side effect. Uh, inducing curvature to the to the detonation, it's just the natural propagation of uh, of of a multi uh, of a multiple or of a multi-dimensional detonation itself that that is causing it. And so and so basically this here it does not violate any of our Z and D rules uh, because it's the shock itself that's just propagating into a free medium, and the shock itself is becoming curved, okay, as it just naturally propagates into that medium. Um, okay, and so are there any questions with that? Okay, and then, okay, yeah, we're gonna start to get into the analysis of these. Uh, and you guys will get into the analysis of these in a, in a lot more detail uh, in your first computer project. Um, but, um, but yeah, so if there are no um, uh, questions, I think this is a good spot to end it for today. Um,